Hello, everyone, and welcome to MFL Total Access, the last episode of the 2024 season. And we have none other than John Evans here. That's me. Uh, Will Power is too busy celebrating that uh, D1 championship, so we could uh, talk shit about him all we want. Even though there's not really much to do. He's got a lot of work to do setting up the winter season and all that. So, (laughs) yeah, he's a busy boy. So, you got us two here. uh, Yeah. Um, you know, we won't have the same in-depth analysis as you would if Willie was here, but we'll do our best. Yeah. Willie was freaking solid the last episode. He saved the best for, like, the the playoffs. I felt during the regular season, he seemed out of it at times, wasn't really, like, giving in too much insight. But then in the playoffs, he was going bananas. Like, he started paying attention in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. At least he did when he, he was playing. It showed Exactly. Up. That's what I mean, Mike. This past Saturday. So... Yeah. Before we start, I know you said you've been on other seasons before and you've already said the story, but as the league grows, we're getting more and more new players. So some people still haven't heard it. If you want to kind of explain how the MFL began and uh, yeah, for sure. Back uh, yourself in the league. So uh, as some of you may not even know who I am, uh, I'm John <laughs> Evans. Uh, you may have gotten emails from me. Uh, uh, I'm the one who started the league. Um, what happened was, oh man, like 15 years ago, I guess, something crazy like that. Uh, I had decided I wanted to start playing football again. It was really hard to find football. So I just put up uh, Kijiji ads and people started showing up and more and more people kept showing up and we got more serious. And uh, eventually someone said, uh, we should make teams. We did that. Uh, and then I made that app that you see tracking the stats. Um, and then someone said, you could get paid for this. And I said, hmm, maybe I could. And so that's the start of the league. But uh, Terry is right uh, that we are expanding uh, amazingly quickly, honestly. Uh, with, I mean, also, honestly, his amazing work um, on Laval this year, where we, I, we, we had been talking about it. And then sort of at the last minute, Terry said, like, what if I just go ahead with this? And then he went ahead with it. And we had 10 teams in our first season, which is genuinely fantastic. That is so hard to do to get 10 teams sort of zero to 10. It's crazy. I mean, when we started, we were four teams. And I think it took us two years to break the 10 mark. I think we went 4, 8, 12, something, something like that. So to get 10 right off the bat uh, is fantastic for Laval. So, uh, yeah, congratulations on that, Terry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for trusting us on that. And, yeah, when oh. we initially started talking about it, we are like, we'll, we'll aim for next spring. Like, I think we started discussing yeah. for the first time May, June, and we're like, okay, we'll, we'll put something in place, a structure for next spring. We'll have a whole winter to advertise. Then I think it was in the month of – in July, we had our uh, official registration. We'll go out of it. Like, I think it was end of June or mid-June or, like, Let's just very shortly before we start. Let's just add it to the email and see if we get enough teams, and then yeah. we'll go from there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's been, that's been fantastic and a huge you know area of growth for the league. So yeah, kind of uh, like the- and I think I think very much Laval continues the the sort of mantra of the league, which is you know um, I was gonna I was gonna say a gentle place, but uh, like a nice environment to play in. Like we have, I definitely feel like you know we have that family environment and Laval is has that um that feeling there so that's yeah. very nice of course yeah and the women was huge this year too we had uh, five teams in the spring six teams in the fall so that that also grew um, yeah the the women's league starting you know that that was something so i was talking about this the other day where i was hesitant at first about a women's league because i sort of had this like i i believe that there are many women who play, I mean, this is just true. It's not a belief. There are many women who play in the MFL who are who are better than a lot of men who play in uh, the MFL. Um, I would say almost every uh, player in the women's league is faster than I am. So like, <laughs> I, I just, I don't believe in this division between um, the sexes necessarily. However, enough women came to me and said that they would just feel more comfortable playing with just women. And it wasn't a question of skill level. And at that point, I sort of said, okay, let's let's do this. Because at that point, we weren't separating anyone because the skill level just, it's, you know, more more comfortable environment. And I totally get that. Yeah. So once we did that and we, 16, uh, five teams off the bat, six teams next season, uh, people seem to have a great time in it. We're getting out of it. We're having a win, uh, women's 
uh, division in the winter season for the first time ever as well, which is fantastic. Um, or at least we're trying to. So if you're not registered for that yet uh, and you want to play on the women, in the women's division, do that. Yeah, no, definitely uh, great. Uh, and looking forward to it to its growth and to hopefully now uh, deciphering the skill division within the women's division. Having yeah, yeah that's it. That's what I said. Yes, I think soon enough we'll have uh, two divisions within the women's division, and that'll be fantastic. Uh, and I know a lot of people want that as well. You know, it's always tough. Sorry, I still have a cold. I've been sick for five weeks, and I'm getting better. I'm almost there. Um, but uh, yeah, I know. It's always tough when you're for, at the beginning because you can't really, even if you have six teams and three of them are at one skill level and three of them are at the other skill level, you can't divide them because then you got two divisions of three teams. So really until you hit about 10 teams, you you can't really divide divisions. So uh, that's the goal for very soon in the future to hit you know 10 to 12 teams uh, so that we can start splitting the, the women up into different skill divisions, just like we do the co-ed rest of the league. Yeah, no, well, so and speaking of that women's division, let's start with that finals uh, right off the bat to recap the, the final week that was of the MFL season. And yeah. uh, so we had Steelers who had that undefeated crazy season already beating Tigres twice in the regular season, facing off in the finals. Um, so rarely do you see one player that's not the quarterback have such a big impact in this game. And that was the case for Steelers as they were missing Iveli, who is their snapper. You can see the game started off uh, uh, Steelers on their first position had a rush interference penalty and a muff snap to eventually go turnover on downs. And that was the story for most of the game on the offense as they weren't able to roll the way they used to be. And uh, that, that snapper position doesn't get enough love. It's kind of that underrated position where if you don't notice it, it means they're doing something well. But then when they're yeah, not, yeah, yeah. You, you you see what can potentially go wrong, right? Absolutely. Actually, when when we, in Div 3, when we played uh, CIA Fusion, they didn't have Barbara. Actually, I don't think they had her for the final either, uh, who's their regular snapper. And, I mean, not not the SAS, their snapper who was there, you know, did an okay job. But he had, like, I think four or five muff snaps. Uh, or... At least three or four, and then some like wild ones, you know, which yeah. uh, Alex had to like jump and turn around and like, you know, was, you're already running away by the time you've caught the ball. Um, and they still beat us, so good for Alex. But yeah. um, but I could see like what you know what a big effect it was having because you know that's not a normal thing to muff that many snaps from your normal center. Yeah, so, so you so agree very much. Very much missing your center is a is a big thing, and centers don't get enough enough love. Yeah, and uh, they did rotate a little bit, but it was Melissa An who uh, snapped for the majority of his game, getting the bulk of the the the, the catches. And the biggest one was late in the game with under two minutes, getting that seven-yard touchdown and take the lead. Um, there was an interesting scenario in the game here. Late in the game, uh, Steelers were up with 30 seconds remaining. Oh, sorry, before that, Tigres were, were down six with 45 seconds. They decided to punt. They slot all three timeouts, fourth and ten. Uh, there was some question marks in the fans because this, this game probably had the most fans in all the finals. Uh, yeah, there were yeah. people that were watching this game over the D1 finals that was happening at the same time, and the intensity was great. Like you would have expected a high scoring game, but it was a super low scoring defensive yeah, game. Yeah. No, no, I was running the game. Listen. And it was constant cheers, constant you know noise from, from over there. I, I would say overall, I mean, first of all, well, what a beautiful day for football. And I, like, honestly, to me, I was just saying, that is like ideal football weather. Like if you yeah. see, like it was 14 degrees and sunny. That's perfect. It's just it perfect. It's not hot. It's perfect. And there was such a great crowd that came out for all the finals. And it was it was just fantastic to be there. Honestly, uh, to have that uh, that crowd, that atmosphere, that you know people cheering everyone uh, along as we went. It was it was great. Yeah. And yes, the fans were very loud. Yeah. So it was one of the. Smallest divisions for now in terms of number of teams, but definitely the ones that brought the most fans almost to all their games, yeah, uh, which is great for the, the community vibe and all that. And then, absolutely, yeah, with under a minute left, uh, TDS had kind of two shots to tie the game. They decided to punt. Uh, it wasn't a bad idea as they forced uh, Steelers to three and out, and then Steelers punted the ball right back to them. Uh, on the very last play, Hail Mary type play, uh, Paola gets, uh, her, her arm gets hit. So those are roughing the passer penalty there. 
replay the right. last play, same uh, result though as Cristal intercepted the ball both times on the the penalized play and on the actual last play of the game, and that ended the season. And yeah. uh, Steelers are your champions. If you, go, if you go back to that play, Bob, I'll tell you why I really don't like the the punt. Because with that little time left, there's the main thing is the clock management, and I'm I'm going to say I see. Every division, there are people who have trouble with clock management. And I one down. It's not like any particular division. But uh, 43 seconds left. You know what I'll actually say? People do this crap in the NFL as well. They don't do the timing right. I can't yeah. believe time is so bad in the NFL, MFL sometimes. NFL sometimes. Uh, 43 seconds left. You know you have to, like, three and out them. I assume they have three timeouts. You're going to have to three and out them no matter what, right? Like. I, I spoke to some people and they were saying that they were hoping for a turnover. Like they, they knew that even if they get the ball back, they get the ball back with no timeouts and no time. So their goal was to put them deep in their zone and hope for a safety or a, an interception. That that's what the, that that was their logic into punting yeah, the ball. I, I can see that, but like you really, the thing you can rely on there is if we make them go three and out, we get the ball back. Um, and. I, I would almost feel because here's the thing: if you go through, if you punt, and they're on their five, and they go three and out, they're gonna punt. Yeah, and it's gonna be on their five. I don't know where they are on the field. I assume because it was three incomplete passes, they were on their own five anyway. Yeah, they were on their own five. But the thing is, you know, you have to three and out them. I mean, you're not getting a safe. Oh, well, I guess if you punt, but like you, you have to three and out them. Yeah. So the first down ends the game at that point anyway. So I get your point. You're basically saying that. that and maybe that fourth down, you get it. That's the thing. Maybe it's only a, I mean, fourth and 10 is not an impossible thing to get. So, you know, maybe it's a 20% conversion or something. I would still take that one in five chance to keep my drive going than having to 100% have to three and out them. If they get first down, the game's over. Yeah. If you don't, you know what I mean? So, and then and again, in that case, you're going to just get it back on your five anyway. And I know you, you know, and you're, you're, you're starting with so little time that at that point, like you're gonna have well, how much time did they have left? 15, 20 seconds, something like that. Yeah, like, like very little time. I I would rather take forty three seconds, three timeouts, and go for a first down twenty percent. Like, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I totally agree. I I I don't think I think punts are there uh, like just in the rule book, but they, they shouldn't be used in in real life like uh, on the field. <laughs> to be fair, in a twelve six game where the last score is coming with two minutes left, you got to punt during that game because that means it's zero six and six six for like yeah yeah. 5% of the game. When it's that low scoring, when it's a defensive battle like that, absolutely. Also, you know, with Melissa Ann, besides having that uh, touchdown, she has like literally half the receptions of the team and almost half the yardage of the team as a whole, which is, you know, that's center position, man. That's where the that's where yeah. the ball goes. Yeah. So congrats, Steelers. Undefeated season. Yeah. Dethroning the, the, the previous champs in Tigres. Uh, hopefully they come back next spring and get their rematch. Uh, yeah, also, congrats to them for having by far the hardest name for Anglophones to pronounce. Steelers? Steelers. <laughs> it's not Steelers. There's a uses in there. Steelers? Steelers. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, congrats, congrats all around. Next up, we'll go to Division 5. Who, uh... Saw the one seed slicks against the two seed uh, Jungle Squad in this one. Uh, Jungle Squad had few injuries throughout the season, but they pulled it together uh, and defeated Slicks twenty four to six in this one. Uh, I, I caught most of this game. It was really impressive the, the way Jungle Squad was playing defensively to limit Slicks and especially like Luke on uh, on the ground. Like nine attempts for forty nine yards. It, it does seem good, but he could run for over hundred yards any given game if you. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've seen it, like him just take over games running. Yeah. And uh, like I saw a few like short yardage situations where he was rolling out, looking for a pass, trying to run, not. And like Jungle Squad were just so uh, great at stopping it. Like they're, everyone was really um, like uh, like taking their responsibility to heart and they knew the zone. Like Goldrick really coached his team up really well. His his experience playing flag football really showed in this team because this team had, had talent. They're just kind of missing that teacher uh, role player uh, to help them out with yeah. the experience in the game because um, you look at the stats all around like Goldrick had a great game but uh, both Julians even Perry like the ball distribution was phenomenal five oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone getting a touchdown there uh, 
even on defense, they added help. Uh, it was like a team effort, right? You got four different players with the pick. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so really well-deserved win by Jungle Squad. Uh, it's crazy because even Slicks, like both these teams started off in Division 5, and they had a few um, pretty bad seasons. Like we're not going <laughs> to put it uh, not gonna put lightly. Like they, they both had a seasons under 500, like uh, and more than one to start off in their MFL journey and see both of them making them to a, a finals, regardless of what division it is. It's just... It just reassures any team that starts out in the MFL, like, uh, your time will come, right? Just put in the work and play. Oh, yeah. Like, honestly, the, the the learning curve of the first season or two is once you, you get, like, forget skill, forget, you know, talent or experience or with football, I mean, athleticism, whatever. I mean, don't forget all of those things. Think about those <laughs> things sometimes. But, like, the amount of difference that, Team cohesion and experience with flag specifically helps. Uh, it changes like you see all the time. Like we used to, we used to put together. I mean, we still put together free agent teams, but we used to put them together. We'd go see their talent, and we'd be like, "Okay, that's we'll put a bunch of D three players together, and we'll make it a D three team." And they would get smoked because yeah. they don't know how to play flag. They don't know plays. They don't need defenses. And we're just, oh yeah, we gotta. Everyone who's new has to be like a division lower than they should be if yeah. they're a free agent. And that, go, coming back to Goldrick on that, is because they're free agents, they don't have that leader. We do try now to put on experienced players with free agent teams, but Goldrick coming in and just being able to sort of, you know, cement those ideas in people's heads and, and let them know like how um, the game is played. Uh, it's just a huge difference. You, you, you take a 500 team, a sub 500 team to a championship team. You know, that's, that's what that does. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, those players are actually division three players in your example. Like, uh, cause in, in that free agent team, any one of those division three players that got smoked during the season, they would each be able to contribute and play really well okay, on yeah. any division three team. One or two it's of them just, as an FA on yeah. a three team, they would be fine. Yeah. Uh, it's more that structure and, and that leadership that uh, are missing. And then, uh, like whether Goldrick plays a jungle squad again next season or or not, the, the team now has the, the knowledge. Kind of like you with Hawks, for example. Hawks were that free agent team that uh, were yeah. called Namad that were missing that structure. You joined them for a few seasons. And like so, so many people I've spoken to on that team, I told me they've learned so much. Like now they know what a five, how to actually run a five yard hook. You have to actually turn on a five yards when it's called a five yard hook and not turn around a seven, eight, nine yards. It is remarkable how big a difference that is and how. Like a new player might not be thinking about it, like because because for a lot of new players, it's like just to use the five yard hook as an example. It's like this rough estimate. <laughs> yeah. And the problem is then you have like let's say you run all hooks and you the quarterbacks got people running them at uh, it's always too long. People never run them too short at the beginning. So it's like seven to twelve yards people are running hooks because it's just sort of like oh it's a I'll hook somewhere downfield. <clears throat> and then uh, you show them you just say you know the basics of like look the rusher bag's at seven. If you're past the rusher bag, you are more than two yards too deep. And I'll say most of the time when you first explain this to a new team, everybody is past the rusher bag. So yeah, like basic, basic stuff can make such a huge difference. And then, you know, especially Goldberg coming in as quarterback, just being, uh, you know, calm and, and capable of calling plays and everything. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's why he, he was the MVP of this game, the MVP of the, the, the the whole division the season MVP and uh, really well deserved but he played great this year I mean it's yeah. just too bad he's such a jerk but other than that like you know he played great <laughs> yeah but it really like uh, we're talking about Gojek a lot but I just want to still emphasize that the whole team part of it like they 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 did the job like they were catching the ball from Gojek they were playing more deep oh, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I think defensively like to get to to stop slicks at six points yeah is, is remarkable you know yeah. All right, once you go up the divisions, uh, Division 4 now, we saw Witching Hour, another team complete another undefeated season here. Uh, maybe they were in the wrong division. Maybe they yeah. weren't. Uh, that semifinal game against FAT players was a close one. Uh, Could have went either way. FAT may also be in the wrong division, <laughs> I'll, I'll say. I think both those guys might be moving up in the Oh, the yeah, definitely should be moving up in the spring to Division 3. Uh, it's yeah. always tough when it's a new team. Uh Right, like I, I, I yeah, even yeah. them afterwards, and they still reinforce. Like literally, only three of the players on this team have 
played football or flag football in their lives. The rest of the team was like a bunch of friends who were more like hockey players or like would just throw the ball out of the park, you know, never really played organized football. And yeah. usually you kind of start in division four or five, I'd say. Like you will never see like a brand new team with barely any experience come in in division three and have oh. some success unless they played in another league or played all together in high school or something like that. So um, the, the decision made sense preseason. Uh, I just think that yeah, they even surprised themselves. I don't think it was unfair to put them in that uh, division or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, one of the game changers in this game was that uh, Wichnera had Vincent Marotte, who uh, also plays D1 with Iron Rush rush in this game. Not necessarily their usual rusher, but with a quarterback like Olivier Watier that uh, gains a lot of yards with his legs and buys time with the plays. Uh, having him rush and get two sacks in this game, I think, really shut down the Blue Badgers' offense completely. Uh, mm -hmm. Blue Badgers have been a really good team in the regular season for many years now. Uh, they actually want a playoff game. They, usually they, they go one and done in the playoffs. Uh, so they have that to, to build on. But Witching Hour were clearly the best team this whole season, the best team in this game. And uh, they somehow probably their best offensive player. You see only three catches for six yards. It goes to show that they have other ballers on the field as well. Uh, notably, uh, Tristan, who led the way with six catches. Uh, Jeremy and Jordan with over 50 yards. Um, I'm excited to see this team next season come back in Division Three and face some competition. You know, because yes, they were they weren't it wasn't entirely unfair. They were in most of the games, but uh, there were some games that were maybe a touch too easy for them. And to face other teams of their caliber or greater to see how they'll respond uh, yeah. would be fun. Oh yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and I also think uh, Vincent uh, was was quite a steal for the Iron Wolves. Oh yeah, what a pickup. I mean, he doesn't have a crazy high rating yet, but uh, probably because he, you know, I think he played five or six games in in D one. So yeah, I think the first two were like uh, he was a sub, so I don't, I don't think his rating got calculated. Yeah. D one rating didn't get calculated. That's what, that's what I mean. Even if he played five or six games, because our algorithm for the ratings, by the way, is uh, like a per game, uh, not not for the season, because otherwise, obviously, people who played six yeah. games or whatever lower ratings, but. Um, you know, in your first five, six games in a higher division with a bunch of people you don't know, you're not going to get as many touches, as many plays, as much playing time, et cetera, especially as, like you said, he was a sub in a couple of games. Uh, so I still I still think he has um, a uh, a bargain of a rating at the moment. Oh, definitely. But as you saw, he already got recruited on a D1 team, so it's just a matter of time. That oh, yeah, but I'm sure there's some D2 teams sniffing around. 76.09? Yeah. Yeah, 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 let's take that on. That's, <laughs> that's pretty big. Yeah. So that pretty much does it for Division 4. I'm excited to talk about the Division 3 because uh, this has to be probably the game. Well, oh, what a game. There are quite a few games, but I, I think this one gets the slight edges of the game of the day uh, yeah. it, uh, of all the finals. Uh, how many lead changes were there in the last couple of minutes? It was... Well, that's, that's what I wrote, uh, I think, in the little write-up for it. It's, it's something... Well, if you look, it's like in the last... Th Three minutes. The gate. The the lead changes uh, three times. Yeah. So yeah, fourth down run by Alex Zabliski to get the touchdown, the go ahead touchdown, to take the lead thirty to twenty six. Uh, convert fails there. Obviously they go for two, and with three minutes left, Ducks do like a great job killing. You you'd say almost the majority, like the whole clock, right? They only leave fifteen yeah. seconds on the board. Like with three minutes left it's so easy to score too quickly on a if something's open downfield and they really march the field look you have one yard completion nine yard one yard four yard four yard five they're really taking what the defense is giving you up until the last two three and two yards uh, for the touchdown there so like you couldn't really have done a better job of not scoring too fast i, I kind of think maybe the plays that seem like pretty quick there i think maybe cia was calling their timeouts at, towards the end uh and they weren't wasting as much time in between plays but a three-minute drive that ends with a score. Uh, it, it's hard to like beat yourself up on that afterwards, and then leaving 15 seconds seconds left to, to CIA. And uh, oh yeah, I think everybody basically felt the game was over. Oh yeah, like, we were talking about who the MVP would be for Ducks at that point while CIA were driving the field, uh, and then CIA scores, and we had to make a switch. CIA did have one timeout left. They had to, maybe two. I have Maybe to... they just called the timeout at the end. Yeah, because they, they called it after the first. Yeah. Um, and you'll, you'll see there that it actually shows that the, the second to last play was at zero seconds, but just 
just to clarify that uh, it was it was at one second. The timeout was just put in too late, but it was it was blown timeout in the scorekeeper. Yeah. This is this is standard done. There's no funniness there. Yeah. Is, if the ref blows it dead and the scorekeeper doesn't immediately hit timeout, the clock is going to go to zero. But it was definitely with one second, which I'll actually point out in D3 and D1 late in the first half, I want to say in D1 and obviously at the end of the game here, both teams managed to get a playoff in, in five seconds. Very yes. quick play, you know, and get that timeout in. And, um, you know, that's remarkable uh, uh, time management. And yeah, for for that that last drive, it still I mean, it still seemed kind of you know wasn't going to happen, whatever. And and but that I mean, also there was a little controversy on the the last catch. It didn't look there was no real, there was no real controversy. The only controversy was someone disagreed with it. But yeah. fortunately, we had Lorianne right there filming it, and uh, it was very clearly a catch, very clearly. Yeah, uh, and uh, I, I trust our officials, and I think it was uh, Alex Holloway. Oh, no, I mean, right it, there. it wasn't my fault, but from the other side of the field, it definitely looked in as well. I yeah, mean, yeah. But, like, you know, we three Fs doing their job. Uh, and, and I think it was Willie that was beside me during that last drive, and he was just saying that, like, it, it's – Ducks are playing too conservative. Like, you'd think that – the CIA down um, uh, a score with just 10 seconds to go and two timeouts, they would maybe attack the deep more often. And the first play of the game, you see Alex takes off and runs for just seven yards, and it's only an eight-yard catch. But then it was a 12-yard yeah. catch and a 14-yard catch for the touchdown. Like it, it was like, like now the way you see that it was scripted, it was very, very smart play calling and taking what the defense was giving you and not forcing, not needing a 30-yard bomb on the last play necessarily. Yeah. But uh, Ducks were playing as if there was one or two plays remaining because they were really, really leaving the underneath uh, a bit too much there. I, I would agree, but I, I it, you know, 10 seconds left, especially with the six seconds. I think one thing is people don't realize how fast the play is. Yeah. Like, I'll also say, mentioning the same thing in the first, in the Div 1 game where they were like, oh, that play didn't take six seconds. Because it was again, it's exactly six seconds of the clock, and uh, the timeout went in and everything. I, and I, I had said because it was like a very quick, like basically Willie caught the the snap, threw it, guy got tackled, timeout. Um, that that takes like four seconds. Like yeah. a snap going to the quarterback is like less than a second. So if he catches that, turns and throws, the ball's out of his hands within like genuinely two seconds. Then it's a one sec, like you know what I mean. Like a second is a long time in football. There's a lot that can happen in a second. Yeah, I agree. so people people are surprised by this, but honestly, you run like you know uh, a relatively short play, and you can call like like the eight yard pass there. You can call a timeout, and it doesn't have to take uh, that long. If anything, the duck should have just like taken a few seconds to deflag him to make sure it's the last play of the game. Yeah. But I, don't I think with about that in the moment. But that's that's what I would have said. I would have said let give him two extra yards and make sure the game is over. Yeah, yeah. You would have, yeah. I guess now, would you have thought of that in the moment, like on defense while you're calling your defense? Oh no, no, no. I would not have thought of that in the morning. But now I'll think about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the app does make a really like loud beep when it's at zero seconds. It's a different beep than anything else. Uh, it's the beep of uh, when it hits zero on the play clock. So it's louder and it's like a little bit more piercing. So it's yeah, yeah. very off. You could almost tell your defense with six seconds of left of like, if they throw it short, don't make a tackle until you hear that beep. Because then you know it's already you hit. Make sure to make a tackle after hearing the beep though. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that's what I meant. Make the tackle after you hear yeah. that loud beep. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yes, make sure you actually make the tackle. But I mean, you could just sort of stay with a guy in front of him, impede his progress a little bit and not yeah. just... Well, at that point, the offense could also just say, like, I'll make the catch and take a knee and then call the timeout. They could, but then will the offense think about that? Yeah, yeah. It's a chess game, right? And the uh, never think about not getting yardage. Yeah, true. true. I mean, I've seen people catch a three-yard, you know, hook, and they're just meant to go downfield, and they've turned it and tried to, like, you know, loop around, and they end up with negative one yards because uh, they were trying to beat the entire team i don't know <laughs> yeah 
And uh, besides Alex, who was the MVP, uh, the McAleers had a huge game, father and son, combining for 16 catches, uh, over 50% of uh, Alex's uh, completions there. Uh, Connor had a beauty of a catch in the back of the end zone. Uh, but still, I mean, honestly, really good ball distribution as well there. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and also, huge shout out to uh, Greg for playing with a broken <laughs> nose and coming out with the, the face yeah. guard. That, 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 ballsy as hell and, and, uh, and you know i like that. i like saying that i mean yeah. i didn't want him to get hurt obviously or anything but I, I you know that little bit of a little bit of toughness and grit it was nice to see yeah and we didn't even speak about the uh, jared's touchdown catch the game winning touchdown catch where alex rolled out bought some time and just launched it to him in the end zone uh to, to seal the the championship there yeah running out the side of the end zone caught it just slipped the two feet down possessed the ball uh, went out it, like you know what what a way to end uh a, you know a game what, what like how exciting I, either way on that play you know what I mean because they're 14 yards out of the end zone so catch or no catch touchdown no catch touchdown that's the game on that play and I, that's what I want to see you know like yeah. that's everything comes down to this and uh there's no you know some a lot of games you'll have a turnover and now basically the defense is the offense is now just killing the clock because they have the lead or they have a two score lead or whatever and it's you know the game is over for like five plus minutes essentially i mean that doesn't happen that often but it does or even when a game is over with you know several minutes left and the team's just killing the clock um you know it's exciting if you win a championship to win a championship period but to win a championship on the last play of the game i mean it's also like Shout out to the Ducks. What what a game they played as well. You know, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think a lot of people uh, thought you know the Ducks weren't necessarily going to be great this season, uh, and, but they went seven and three. Uh, and nice, yeah, shout huge shout out to them. And Antoine Bissell is one guy like Vincent Marot who got recruited in Division One, and I think he's one of the next. Uh, uh, stars in, in, in the MFL getting two touchdowns on three catches, 84 yards, two de two defensive interceptions as well. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time and maybe just a matter of him, his schedule, why he's not playing Division One or two yet, but uh, definitely a player that could be a key factor in a higher division yeah. team. I mean, but he, he's got a high rating now, though. Eh? No, he got... Uh, he, he oh, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. Well, which is uh, merited after his crazy season, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious that he's higher than Vincent, but because Vincent only played as high as Division. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he had a he had a great season. So, uh, yeah. Do do Ducks or CIA move up? I doubt it. They they can't. They're not going to go to D two. I don't think. Well, I guess it'll depend on the structure of the teams, where the cap brings them, and uh, what we decide in, for the spring, because. I'll say having having played them, I think we went zero and two against Ducks and one and one against CIA. I didn't feel that they were like unfair for the division. Oh no, like, I didn't think so either. I felt like those were all winnable. I think the Ducks beat us in the last game, play of the game or something like that as well. But like, yeah, I, you know, I always felt like you know those are winnable games, which is that's what you want. You want like we were yeah. a middle of the pack team, and you want a middle of the pack team to be able to feel like they could beat the top team. Yeah, no, that is good, but, but that it's possible. No, most of our divisions have a lot of parity. Outside the realistic. Yeah, realistic. No, most of the divisions definitely had a lot of parity, and this was one of them. Yeah. All right, so we got Division 2 and Division 1 left. Let's go to Division 2, where respect win back-to-back uh, -back championships in this division. Um, didn't look like it at some point during this game. Nice TD scored early in the game on their first drive, 35-yard bomb to Andrew. Actually, no, it was not their first drive. Uh, there was an interception on the first drive, and then a turnover on downs for respect, which was very uncharacteristic from both these teams. But yeah. on the very next play, and uh, Guillaume to Andrew, 35-yard touchdown. Uh, that connection was uh, on fire this whole season. Yeah. Uh, I think Andrew might turn out to be a good player. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Maybe a D1 team might recruit him. 
Yeah, uh, nice. He's got Ben Fulbauer back in this game, who was injured for the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, good to see him back on the field. At least there wasn't nothing, yeah. not a major injury there. He contributed four catches, two of them going for touchdowns. Yeah. And, uh, Guillaume got a few people involved, quite a few people involved, going for over 260 yards, five touchdowns. But I think it's the two interceptions that made the difference in this game, especially the one late in the second half. Um, yeah, because on the play by play. And with what, 13 minutes left? Yeah, so nice TDs were up nine points midway through the second half. Uh, it looked like everything was going their way. And then the Steve to Ben Denis 45 yard touchdown, where there were three. So, yeah, that was, that was a little uh, awesome referee moment because so, so what happened was Ben caught, I don't know, maybe a five yard hook or something like that, a short pass. And he sort of gets like hit pretty hard from behind and like arms reaching around him and all that sort of thing while he's making the catch. All three refs throw their flag uh, for for unnecessary contact, but a lot of people would have blown it dead there, but that the play's not dead just because, you know, unless there's, you know, risk of injury or whatever, the play doesn't dead, isn't dead just because someone gets bumped uh, or, or, you know, it illegally held or anything. Um, Cause he wasn't deep flagged, but, the the entire nice TDs team like stopped playing, and Ben just turned up field and ran. And even while he was running, I just felt like nice TDs were just like watching it, like, yeah, you know, it's the the play's over, right? And yeah. like, you know, there were three flags it right in the same area, but not not a whistle blown. And uh, like, yeah, good for the refs, uh, me being one of them. So. Uh, <laughs> good try. Definitely uh, high IQ for the refs, but also high IQ from Ben to. to... Playing to the whistle, right? Everyone yeah, said that. Yeah, what I was going to say, like, you know, I, I, I was genuinely almost, like, confused why the team stopped. Like, I was sitting there going, did someone blow a whistle? Because everybody stopped yeah. and nobody blew So, uh, he, honestly, though, to, to be fair, like, even, like, respect were acting like the play was over. Like, they were, I mean, obviously, they're not allowed to be moving, but they were just sort of, like, not not excited until he like turned up field and, and it was like 10 yards downfield and he realized none of the refs were stopping this yeah so yeah very good for ben there and that was a big turning point because not only is it is it a touchdown uh you know it's a touchdown in 10 seconds you know it's 13 minutes left you're down by nine 12 minutes and 50 seconds left you're down by uh three so you know even yeah. if they had just march down the field, you know, and take five, six, you know, whatever, a Steve drive, four or five minutes off the clock and score, you know, you're under nine minutes. You're under potentially eight minutes with getting the ball back. Uh, and so it, it's a very different game. It's a very different mentality from night, uh, from uh, respect's perspective at that point, because, you know, if you're down nine with like 13 minutes left, like that, uh, three with 13 minutes left, that's, not that big a deal, but if you're down three, don't have the ball, and there's only eight minutes, there are only eight minutes left. Uh, it's it's a very different mentality. You have to be more aggressive on defense. You can't like just let them you know, use up five six minutes. Although, like I said, Steve, I think Steve can basically score in any amount of time. Like you know, you know that thing where we were praising uh, Alex for scoring with like 15 seconds on the clock. If Steve did it, we would just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve does that. Yeah. He does that sometimes, um, but yeah. So, so that that was a huge turnaround uh, to me in the in the game uh, because nice cities were were rolling and respect looked like they were struggling a bit and down by nine, 13 minutes. Yeah, and being down three at that point, the convert is huge. Not because you can make it a tie game or anything like that, but if the score remains a three point score, nice cities score. Don't even need a convert to regain the two possession lead. So, not converting that convert seemed like a bit of momentum for nice TDs, but all that momentum was completely shifted in respect's direction after two plays yeah. later, Lahan getting an insane, like a game-changing interception at that point, and then uh, respect taking the lead and literally not looking back, right? Because they did not concede any other points at that point, winning yeah. the game 40 to 30. I'll also, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously he's played for a while and he's played high position. I will also say uh, Dylan makes any defense better than the sum of its parts, in oh, my yeah. opinion. So, uh, 
I, I think he also made a big difference here. Uh, he rallied the guys. He got them heads on straight. And, you know, once once they sort of were down nine, he sort of just shut that down. And, yeah, you can see his uh, leadership out there. And, and you see it on both sides of the ball, not only on defense, on offensively, 12 catches, 85 yards, two touchdowns, eight tackles on defense. Right. I'm not saying he didn't play well on offense. I'm just saying he's he's the defensive leader. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. And and as as strong as this nice these team was, they and they had five touchdowns. They did not score on their last three drives of the game. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. Like once once they needed it, they kind of shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, just that was also a really good game. Honestly, like overall, just well played. Lots of great plays. Lots of memorable plays. Uh, and, you know, a, a nine-point turnaround in the last 13 minutes is, is always going to be exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I think we had a – we were pretty spoiled with our finals. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, most with of the weather, with teams participating, uh, the games we got. And last but not least, we had the uh, Iron I'm going to say it. I'm going to say least. I'm going to say least. Least? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw it out there. <laughs> We had the Arnolds uh, dethroning the Outlaws. Outlaws were the spring champs. This is a rematch of the spring finals where Outlaws won that one. Uh, and Willie gets it done, uh, playing a near-perfect game here. He had that one interception to Marvin early in the game. Uh, yeah. but 30 for 36 is freaking impressive. 250 yards. Uh, Chris Hope, happy that he could actually throw legally in this division, so there's no forfeit yeah. after the game. Uh, because I think it was I'll figure it out. Maybe it is a forfeit. Maybe 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 how long it was. Was it the first drive or second drive of the game? It was the second drive of the game. It was fourth down and ten. Uh double quarterback, Chris finds Josh all alone for 45 yards uh to take the lead there. Um in I, I don't throw it out. I mean Josh nine catches 138 yards. Yeah. Uh, five touchdowns and a two point conversion. Like it has to be one of the best all time. That's one of the best games. receiver games I think in MFL history. Like, yeah, it's, it, yeah, that most definitely, it, for, it, for sure in the playoffs, like without a doubt, and especially in Division yeah. One. Uh, and he had the, one of the games, like the, the Steve's only interception of the game went into his hands, right? Um, and he had a two point convert, <laughs> a two point convert as well. Uh, but like, I was, oh, yeah. Really, yeah. I was really impressed with not only the way Will played, but how the team rallied around him. Like, the team was really, like, it, it's as if they will, anything Will, will would have told them to do, the, the team would have done it for him. Um, and one thing that I found interesting during their playoff run is that, especially in Division One and Two, almost every team goes for two points. And Arnold stuck with their one-point converts, and it kind of showed it early in the game, right? They were up 14-8, to eight, uh, forcing Outlaws to have to connect on two points there. And then it became a convert battle for a little while up until uh, Arnold took the two-score lead late in the game. But it, it just goes to show that uh, you don't have to follow the mold of everyone, right? There's the, the, the two-point wow. believers, the one-point believers, and even Willie's a huge two-point believer. And he just knew that with this team, with this roster, with the play calls, those one points would pay dividends, and they, they stuck to it. They got quite a few uh, converts there, and it could have been the difference. It was not ultimately, but it very well could have. For me, a lot of it is like, I, I get the reasoning behind the, the, the two – Two points is like you can steal a, a touchdown, yeah, essentially. But to me, you have to ask, like, how much easier is the one point than the two point? Like, if you obviously, if you can get the two point at, you know, better than fifty percent, the one point, then obviously that that works. But when there's going to be a lot of scores, and and there were, you know, a lot of touchdowns, right? Like. Uh, how many how many touchdowns does Willie throw? There's there's seven touchdowns, right? So I mean what's what's the average two point convert rate? I don't know. Like Steve says six touchdowns, you got two two point converts, right? So like a third. That that would be pretty good, I think, if you're getting a third yeah. of your two. I was gonna say twenty percent maybe. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying a third is good. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I think that's definitely above the average. And so I mean you really have to be bad at one point conference or, yeah. or, or, or one point conference to like 
I mean, the reality is, is Will got one more point on converts than than Steve, uh, and that's because he got you know uh, more than uh, half his his touchdowns converted. You know, you're talking about an over fifty percent rate versus uh, a thirty three percent rate, which is still a good rate for two yeah, points. Yeah. Sure. I just feel like at some point. The maths makes sense for the two point convert thing, but I don't know if it translates into reality as well as people think it does. Yeah, I think it, it works fairly well when you have another quarterback who has a great arm and could drop back, and then you have the two quarterback system on the convert. Yeah, I, I'll say, like, if I were A team, I would do nothing but two point converts. Yeah. But I don't think it suits everybody. Yeah. Uh, anyway. And, uh, but yeah, this was, this was a. a like honestly, just an incredible game uh, to watch. It, it was it was super tight, obviously throughout until I mean the the end. Like uh, I almost won by thirteen, but it was closer than that. Outlaws had the ball down seven with two minutes to go. So yeah, exactly. So it's you know, um, if only Steve only had fifteen seconds, he would have done it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th I think yeah, down seven with three minutes. So. Uh, and that was when the pick came. And I mean, that's 100% still the game, right? Like, if that pick doesn't happen, then there are under two minutes. They still have the ball. If that's like a first down, even, you have the you know, the ball and uh, two minutes to score. That's plenty of time. Yeah. Um, now, if they had scored, you go for two or one with zero seconds on the clock? I think they definitely we go for two. I, uh, Outlaws are a team that goes for two in dead general. So with the game on the line, I have no doubt they go for two. Yeah. Uh, so they, they already hit two twos in the game, so I can't see them not. I think, I think as a rule, we should say that at the end of a game, if you score on the last play and you're down by one, you should have to go for two. Regardless of regular season or playoffs? I All the time. All the time. I'd like that I in the regular season because it's like to not have delays. in the for unsportsmanlike. Or what? For unsportsmanlike if you go for a tie. So if you go for one, it'll be from the 15. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we still won't count it because it'll be another unsportsmanlike. Uh, <laughs> no, no, obviously not. But I think I agree that I, to me, even though I'm not great at two point converts, if I'm at the end of the game and it's we're down by one and, and we score, I go for two anyway. Like just, I don't know. I'd rather just like not put the ball in the other player's hand. If you're really good at ones, you could go for the one and then say, I have a chance to win it in overtime. Sure, but I'm just saying, at that point, you're also saying to the other quarterback, like, I'm going to put the ball in your hand at least one more time. I I'm just saying, like, I would rather just have it in my hand to win or lose. Don't let the other guy touch it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I, uh, I, I, Willie, man. Willie will just mess up and it's fine. I'll do, you know, yeah. go over time. He's not going to score. So it was still a, a remarkable season by Outlaws, who completely looked uh, like a new team this season, bringing in guys like Elliot, Clement, uh, whenever yeah, yeah. Division One before there was a uh, Justin White also first time in Division One, I believe. Uh, uh, Nicey Francis from Les Centurions uh, on this team rushing for for them. And uh, look, uh, you'd think Steve could actually win them all, but I guess he actually cannot win them all. Uh, <laughs> well, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a it was really great D one finals, especially when there's over ninety points in a in a D one game. That's a classic yeah. D one finals. Yeah. We're coming up on 100 points scored, you know? Yeah. Interesting to see how these teams come back next spring, depending what the cap is, what we're going to be doing. We spoke about maybe doing that cash prize. Uh, maybe we could advertise it from now uh, in Division One. Yeah. I mean, well, the only thing is Chris Hope is retired, so. Yeah, but oh. he's been retired for the past five years, right? So. Uh... That's true. I mean, he'll be retired. Chris Hope, I think, is retired literally all the time that he's not literally playing football. Yeah. Like even, even during a game, if he like goes off to sub off, he's retired. He really does. But if he does, he's retired. Yeah, yeah. He's retired for that drive. That probably explains why he doesn't say he's playing in the polls that the captains put up in the team chat. I heard he's always out for the game because it's. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. No, this is this is Chris Hope for like forever. This is not this year. This is. Yeah. Chris Hope is never available. He is always too injured, but yeah. he's somehow there and then subbing in another game. and yeah well it's 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 a, the power of god on saturday I wish, I wish i was injured the way chris hope was where, <laughs> when i'm 
hurt, I can still play football like that. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I, when he speaks to me, I believe him that he's injured, but when I see the ball in his hands and the way his feet move, it, it, there's nothing injured there. <laughs> there. There are times where he has played, uh, and I've seen it where he's he's honestly hurt, you can tell. Um, but, yeah, I think, I mean, Chris is, you just get older, and at some point you're always injured. You're just, yeah. like, honestly, at, even at my age, I'm basically always injured in so, at, in, oh, at some point. hurt so much the next day, eh? Yeah, and well, they just don't go away. Is more they're always just gonna be bugging you. Like, you know, you tweak somewhat something, and if you were like thirty or younger, it would be like, oh, I like I kind of hurt my knee, and an hour later you forgot uh, that it happened. Whereas forty, you're sort of like, oh, I tweaked my knee. I'm not gonna walk right for two weeks. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the big difference. But you know. Um, yeah. Growing older can suck, but it's better than the old. Right? This fall season really flew by. We had a great uh, get together for those who were present. Uh, gave away yeah. quite a few uh, credits, awards. Um, yeah. Looking forward to the winter season and to the next spring. Uh, any closing remarks? Last uh, uh, so for a while. Everyone who came out for the get together, it, it keeps getting bigger, and we're slowly filling up that bar, which is really nice. Uh, we we started spreading out to the other half of it, which was great um you know we also bothered the hell out of those two people that just came to watch the yeah. Buffalo Bills game. um and uh no i mean I, i'm super looking forward to winter i would say register soon i mean honestly we're filling up very fast we have 30 teams max 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 uh and i know last year we added teams sort of as we went because we like sort of well if we'll grab a time slot or two there and we'll grab a time slot there's nothing there's nothing there there like Talk to the other leagues around all like you know soccer, uh, hurling, whatever what that people are playing in, indoors. Those fields, those indoor fields, are full this year. Um, I mean, mostly because uh, soccer flex closed down, but yeah, yeah. Um, Thirty teams cap, uh, first come first serve. Uh, if you want to play, I strongly suggest you put your team in soon. Yeah, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write to us. Uh... We have the answers, or Willie has the answers. He's, yeah, Willie, he's, he's giving us a, a list. You know, we're just following what he says, really. Yeah. We're just like the, you know, uh, tech help people. We just have our <laughs> list that Willie wrote down and said, yeah, I yeah. tell him. Damn, Does Willie. Your... Does a great job at that. <clears throat> he, great QB, great owner of the league. Fantastic. You know, we keep saying this. Some people are actually going to believe. Well, people already do. That. People already do. So. Yeah. That's kind of how it started, right? Like someone had someone once, thought Willie ran the league. Yeah, like, someone told me like uh, Willie told me to ask you. I'm like, well, why'd you ask Willie in the first place? Like, well, isn't it Willie's league? <laughs> yeah. So just guys uh, the podcast, so I figured it was still watching. Disclaimer: It is not his league. <laughs> He's yeah. just a chart. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. It was great having you on. Uh, yeah, thank you. For I haven't been on. We tried to do it a few times. It didn't work out. You got sick last couple of weeks. Hope you feel better soon. It has not been a great month and a bit for me. But uh, yeah, it, it's great that I could uh, be here today. I, I appreciate you asking me. Yeah. All right. So that does it for MFL Total Access for uh, this episode and for this season. As yeah. always, uh, any feedback was always appreciated. Any questions, we'll answer your questions. Hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you enjoyed the season. Thank you, everyone. See you on the field.